Yeah. Oh, the shop. Because this has started. So the next starting event is. This <laughs> on This is a test. Right. Oh, right. Yeah, maybe. 
with C I'll get started. Morning. So today we're going to start actually programming in parallel. We started last week talking about programming in parallel, <clears throat> the kind of things you could expect when you do that. Um, what a scaling analysis is, but ideally you would get some trouble with having a serial portion in your code. Uh, and then we discussed a little bit about how you would run things that aren't necessarily parallel, that are serial, but 
um, that you have a whole bunch of, so you want to run them in parallel. Um, but not actually coding in parallel, just running in parallel. So today is going to be our first example of actually programming in parallel, uh, using all those cores to work together on a single problem. And today we're going to look at OpenMP, which is one of those uh, ways of doing what is called shared memory programming. Now, shared memory programming builds upon this model of uh, cores working together on a single problem. So there's one big chunk of memory, and all of these CPUs, all of these cores, can see the same memory. So you can imagine your data lives in that memory, and each of the core processes a part of it. And perhaps there's some communication necessary uh, between core one and core two, but that just goes through the memory, right? So uh, boundary cells and all of that are, are all stored where you expect them. So this is a, a very nice way to step from serial code to parallel code um, because, it, because your data doesn't have to change, you're just the way you act upon that data. So what will happen in this, in this uh, scheme is that each, so suppose you had uh, a whole bunch of stuff to do on your data, uh, you basically give different tasks, tasks to each of the cores, uh, different parts to do, different instructions to do. So the instruction of core zero could be uh, take uh, part zero to 100, and uh, multiply all of those data by two, whereas the instructions for core one could be take data 101 until 200 and, and multiply those by two. So those are different instructions that they have to do at the same time. And such a uh, sequence of instructions, that's what's called a threat, a threat of execution. So they do different things at different times, and they can do that because they have their own uh, processing unit, right? their CPUs. But the memory is all shared. It's all, all, this, all the same. So. Um, that's it. So because the memory has to be all the same for OpenMP, that means that this way of programming will not scale beyond a single node. So as we learned at Synads, the general purpose cluster has nodes with eight cores. And so if you want to use more than eight cores on the same, pro same uh, problem, you can do it with OpenMP because you need more than one node, but those no, separate nodes do not see their memory, so they, you don't have this big shared memory block. All right, so there's a limit to how far this can scale. But as we also saw at, uh, last week, most computers are a mix of um, uh, many nodes and uh, many threads, and so uh, we need to know both a threaded approach of a parallel programming and a, a more processed approach, which we'll see next week. What then is OpenMP? Well, it's, it's a programming model for shared memory systems, which is very neat in that it adds parallelism to a already functioning serial code. So if your code is already running, um, but there's parts of it that could be done in parallel by different cores acting on the same data, all you have to do is tell the compiler, hey, here's a bit of code that can be shared uh, among different processors. So this makes it sort of a incremental approach to parallel programming. You don't have to design your whole uh, program from the get-go in parallel. You take a serial code and you start parallelizing chunks of it that can be done in parallel by telling the compiler about that uh, opportunity. But the compiler and the runtime environment do a lot of work for you. Uh, and so uh, we'll have to tell it uh, some, something about what the possibilities are, and we'll see that we do this by adding so-called compiler direct directives, uh, but that's the approach. Uh, this works, by the way, uh, in C, C++, and Fortran, uh, but not beyond. So that's what the standard is. You need a compiled language. So uh, while it's theoretically possible that Java would do it, it doesn't. So what's the basic, uh, the basic way you go about this before we go into the actual syntax? So, in C++, what you do is you add lines to your code just before the parts that can be parallelized. And all those lines start with pound pragma ohm p. Pound pragma is an old way of saying what follows is a compiler dependent bit of uh, instructions or directives that if the compiler doesn't support them, they can safely uh, ignore them and your program will still be correct. So that gets used here. Because if you don't turn on OpenMP uh, capabilities of your compiler, it'll just 
uh, flat out ignore these and will still compile your code. And if this was a serially a working serial code, um, that's fine. It'll just still be working. Now, as I said, uh, you can switch on and switch off uh, OpenMP support. And to switch it off, uh, switch it on, actually, you have to do the dash F OpenMP flag uh, for G++. Uh, this has to be done both for compilation and for link commands. As we will see, um, compiling is not enough to get everything to run. There also has to be a runtime where you can uh, basically activate all those cores uh, or, or set the number of cores. And so there's a runtime as well, a runtime library as well as uh, a language component. Therefore, both when you're compiling, which is the language part, you need dash f openmp. And when you're linking, you need dash f openmp for the compiler to link in the runtime library. Okay. And then there's things that you can tweak uh, when running. Uh, there's a couple of them, but the most important uh, environment variable is called omp underscore num underscore threads. And that determines how many threads will be started. Uh, so that might seem strange. Why wouldn't you just need to take all the cores in your machine? But um, we'll see that this matters in hybrid code, but also matters when you're doing a little test run on a GPC development node. And uh, as you know, it's shared among the different uh, users. You might want to run on a smaller case with less cores, because there's other stuff running as well. Or you just want to see how well your code actually scales. So you want to set the number of threads to one, just use one core, uh, see how your uh, code performs and set it to two, four, six, eight, and that way you can see if it scales linearly or uh, or how bad it, it scales off, and that kind of determines what your optimal point is for uh, the number of threads. I uh, I wrote a couple of examples, um, and they're on Signet in this directory. So if you if you want to follow along or uh, you want to try this out after the class. Uh, you can clone Cynet course scientific computing 2016 OMP. Um, you can just clone that as a Git repository on Cynet. And then you can change directory into o OMP, because Git clone will create a directory called OMP. And then in it, this directory is a little script uh, called setup that loads all the modules that you need and just makes it easier to uh, all have the same environment and make sure the make file works. So source that setup file. And then you can make whatever. Uh, example you want. So the first example we're going to look at is called OMP-hello-world, uh, and so you can make that. Uh, so, this, so there's three parts, the, the code writing, the compiling, and the running, uh, that changes a little bit um, uh, from just serial. So here's that example. This is going to write hello world from a bunch of threads at the same time. So it starts the usual way. I have some IO stream for IO. Uh, OMP is the header that belongs to OpenMP, and then string, because I'm using this to string command. So in main doesn't change. The only thing that's actually different uh, is this pragma OMP parallel. So what that does is it'll, it'll say the next block, the next code block should be run in parallel. And then in that code block, and each of the if each of these threads is supposed to write hello world from, from a certain thread, and it has a way to get its thread numbers. So uh, oops. A bit messed up. Um, so you compile it with this dash f and op, f open and p flag, and then you can just run it, or you can just do make hello world. So this one makes so once you've made it, uh, we're going to set the number of threads to different values to see what happens. When I set it to 1 and I run OpenMP uh, Hello World, I just get a start of program. That was this first line, and then Hello World from thread 0. The threads are numbered from 0 to n minus 1, where n is the number of threads, the number of threads set by OMP num thread. Uh, then I set it to 8, which is uh, usually the optimal for the nodes that we have, because they have 8 cores. And uh, what happens now is we get a start of program. And each of these eight threads starts writing out hello world from thread something, right? some number. Where's the code again? Kind of see what so this first part happens once. This happens eight times in parallel. Now, one thing that you could see immediately is that um, 
this is wrong, right? This is not in order. Why, why is this not in order? Why is it not 0, 1, 2, 3? In fact, if I run it again, you'll find that the order of these changes. It's highly annoying. And write a, how am I going to write a unit test for this? It's random. Uh, this, however, is very typical of parallel programming and something you'll have to learn to live with. When you run in parallel, not every thread starts at exactly the same time, uh, takes exactly the same amount of time, and stops exactly at the same time. In fact, if they all started right at exactly the same time, um, they should override each other. Well, that's not quite how output works. Output actually kind of waits uh, for one another. That's why at least we see these strings as one string. But they don't all get to sending uh, this to screen at exactly the same time. There's like milliseconds difference, or maybe even less. And so whatever thread is first to compose its string and send it off uh, to, to screen just gets to do that. But the order just depends on how much, uh, or which threads were there first, and that changes all the time. So, and it could be that core zero was just momentarily still busy waiting for keyboard input, um, and is therefore slightly uh, later than thread six, and, and therefore would get below that. Um, there's, if you have a dedicated node, you still get this kind of randomness though, even though not much else is going on, because there's still uh, you know, some jitter in, in when the, get their code and uh, where stuff is in memory. It's like tiny random things matter. So when you're programming in parallel, what really should be the case is that it doesn't really matter which order it. As long as they all get executed, that should be fine. Okay. So the Pragma OMP, that's where the language extension comes in. That's what the compiler can do now. The OMP.h gives you access to the library functions. Here's a couple of them. So you can get the number of threads that are currently running. You can get the index of the current threads with OMP get thread num. You can set the number of threads to be used at the next session. So uh, OMP num thread is a way to externally control this. If you wanted to control it from within the program, you can. It's not a very good idea because now your code will only run on eight cores, and now you get a 12 core machine, and your core was compiled to set uh, to use eight. And I have to change your code. So it's not. It's rarely a good idea, but it's there. And you can get a number of processors too. So rather than trusting uh, OMP num threads, uh, you can sort of query uh, what the potentials of your. So let's try a next example, make OMP num threads too. And so very similar, um, the pragma OMP parallel takes the next statement. So it does the same thing, hello world from thread, only get num thread. I didn't need curly braces necessarily, much as for for loops, while loops, etc. A single line can be a code block, and that's what happens here. The single line here is a code block. And so this is the only part that happens in parallel. The next line is not part of the code block, and therefore is, is part of the serial part. So every thread prints out its number, and then we're trying to figure out how many threads there were. Let's look at the output. If you try that, you'd see there's only one thread. I'll show you. Okay, um, so, so although this part still prints the same thing, there, there's only one thread. Why does the last line says there's only one thread? I know you have to trust that me on that. It doesn't say there, there were eight threads, even though only one. Thread. No? Why is it one? It should be eight, right? Maybe one. 
set one because it gives you the number of threads that is currently running. But we're outside of this parallel region. So with OpenMP, your code gets divided by these pragmas in the serial parts and parts where the threads are active. And there's no active threads except the one that is running. And so it's correct. At this point, there's only one thread running. So it'll give you that. Well, that's not, that's great that that's correct, but that's not what we want. We want to know the number of threads in this case. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can only get that if we call open OMP get num threads from within the parallel code, right? But you know, we don't really want to do it every time. Now we get a times reported how many threads are. So what we want to do is to take this value from a parallel region, store it in a variable, and then after the, the threads have uh, stopped running, you'll once write that variable. So that's what this little code is supposed to do. And so variables um, are a, a special story when it comes to shared memory. And, um, and it's kind of funny in a sense. But let's look at the code first without taking too much, uh, spending too much time on what these mean exactly. I have a variable my threads and number threads. <clears throat> I get the current thread number and store it in my threads. And if that is 0, I set the number of threads. So only thread 0 gets the number of threads. Every thread gets their thread number. And then since number of threads is a variable, after I close the parallel region, I print out the number of threads. Um, and it will say 8, or whatever OMP number of threads was. Now, this is shared memory programming, so that's why these nth threads can be written by core 0. And, and I should mention, this core 0, this thread 0, doesn't have to be the same thread as the serial thread. These two can run on different cores. But because it's shared memory, they see the same nth threads variable. And so it can, after the fact, just get that nth threads variable. But with, with OpenMP and with shared memory in general, not everything should be shared. So this variable my thread, for instance, if that were shared, by all the threads, then it could happen that thread 0 writes its, ver its value in my thread. And immediately after, thread 1 writes 1 into my thread, so that by the time I get to the if statement, none of the threads have a, have a my thread 0. You don't see it, because the other threads overwrote it. I need for each thread to be able to store its own thread number which means that, that my thread is not shared. I need to have a private variable for each of the threads, and that variable will be called my threads. So there's two kinds of variables in OpenMP. There's the shared ones, which is what you have in mind when you do shared uh, memory programming, and there's private ones, which are there for the individual work that each thread has to, has to do. And you have to specify what's what. When this is serial, it doesn't matter because there's only one, one possible uh, way that the variables could be. They are the variables of the program. But when you're doing it in parallel, you have to know if this variable is shared among all of the threads or not. And so when you enter a parallel region, you have to specify. The compiler can't know whether you want my threads to be uh, private or not, because they're declared basically the same way, and one is very different than the other. So you say private my thread and shared my threads. Um, to indicate that these variables are uh, are to be behaved like this. OK? Does this make sense? You need some private variables. Note that I said this default none here, and just to explain, there are defaults. So if you don't say anything, some variables are shared and others are private. Um, you can look up the details in the standards. It's only a few hundred pages. See what variables end up being shared or private. It is much better, if you can, to not re rely on these defaults and to be explicit. Because by being explicit, you know exactly what happened. And you can't, that, like when you're debugging, you don't have to suddenly be faced with a variable that, by default, was shared where you thought it would be private. Um, just be explicit. It's going to save you some headaches. So what happens, as I said, it runs. Each thread 
gets a copy of my thread. Uh, right, so this is something to keep in mind. When you have private variables, as soon as you enter the region, this parallel region, rather than having one my thread, I have eight my threads. I actually have eight separate ones because the thread that's running the serial part does not coincide with any of the parallel threads necessarily. So if this is a very big uh, variable, if it's an array, uh, you might want to be careful making it private because now suddenly uh, you're taking up a lot of memory. You use private somewhat sparingly because you need them for each of the, of the threads. Now, another thing that is kind of nice, um, especially now that we're doing C++ uh, in this course, is that if you declared your variables inside a block, which you can do, they are automatically private. So in this way, I moved the declaration of the int my thread. And you can kind of think of this as, OK, when this is executed, each thread sees a declaration of an integer and does that. So they all basically allocate an integer. Since this my thread is now automatically uh, a, uh, a private variable, I don't have to include it in uh, the specifications default and shared. In fact, I can't because when it enters this region, there is no variable called my thread. Okay, so anything that's declared local in in the parallel block is a private variable. Okay, so we we try to make sure that only one core executed the call to get the number of threads. It's a very common thing to want only one core to execute something. So most of the stuff is in parallel, but this is one thing that only a single core should do. Uh, usually it's output. Say you have some time stepping uh, routine, and every now and then you want to say, oh, I'm at, at time step 100, 200, so that you can see there's progression. You don't want eight cores to say, hey, we're all at step 100, especially if, you, if, if that scales, uh, you get way too many uh, messages. So one core. But we didn't really care which core it was, right? We said core zero because there's always a core number zero, um, right? But maybe core six was at that point in the code earlier. Why doesn't it do it? So for efficiency, it's better to just say, well, whichever core gets there first gets to execute that, and the rest just so. So there's a, a pragma for that called pragma OMP single. And so this little code does the exact same thing as we just saw. It has a parallel region, it shares n threads, but then the block that it takes is a single line, but that it's also prepended by OMP single. It says only the first thread that gets there executed. So we don't know if it's 0, 1, 2, we don't need to know. We don't need its, its, uh, its thread number, because whoever gets there first gets to execute this. And so this is a very short way <coughs> of getting the number of threads that will run in a parallel session section. When you can, it is advisable to write your OpenMP code such that you don't have to know the number of the thread. Ideally, because as, as soon as you have to worry about the number of, of the thread, the index of the thread, your code no longer looks like the serial code. This looks like the serial code. If I leave out these lines, OpenMP num threads will just give, give one, because there's one thread running, and, and I have no issues, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Um, often it is, uh, but it depends. Some uh, it depends on what you t how the operating system is set up. So, for instance, at Cynet, um, we have these Intel chips that have eight cores, or there's actually two of them that have four, uh, but they allow a thing called hyperthreading, where uh, you can overload them with more than one thread, and two threads is sort of the, the, the best you can do. So they can pretend to be able to run 16 threads. And the way that's done is that the operating system is set up to pretend there are 16 threads. So, the mech so when you set nothing for OMP num threads, 
um, the runtime just looks at, okay, how many cores are there here? And it will say 16, which is not true. Okay. So because of that, it's actually good to play with OpenMP, uh, uh, OMP NumThread. Sometimes your code gets slower <coughs> using this hyperthreading. And so you will want to scale back to eight. Uh, and so the only way to know is kind of to test. So that's the uh, that's a single execution part, and the the basics of of variables. So the variables are are <clears throat> there's two tricky parts to doing OpenMP. There's the finding out what can be done in parallel, and finding out what your variables should be private or shared, and that's essentially what what the whole thing boils down to. Now, we looked at an example where every thread did the same thing. There was an if statement that made one thread do a little bit uh, of a different task. But um, what we really want to use these cores for is to work on a single problem and divide the work. And so one of the most common kind of works that we have in scientific codes are loops, right? So consider a, uh, so we want to know how to basically divide work in a loop. And OpenMP has a construction for that. Uh, construct for that, so we can build all of the next. So stare at this bit is a code for a second. What I've done is basically the same as before. Um, there's a, a my thread, there's private, um, and I'm trying to take my thread and write a loop. So just put a loop in there. A note. I think I forgot it on the previous thread, but. Um, since I want to use this standard out thingy to write out, I actually have to declare std count as shared uh, because it's a variable. If I don't declare them with default none, the compiler can say I don't know what c out is uh, because in the, it, it, because you haven't said what I should what, what, how it should be cleared within this block. Um, anyway, that's a, a, a yeah. So this is a loop within a parallel block. So. <clears throat> Say we have two threads. This, this counts from one to from zero to fifteen, really. Um, in and it prints the thread number. What do you think it's going to do? So we've parallelized this this block of code. We said, eh, make it parallel, and we put in a loop. How many numbers am I going to see? How many lines of output? Sixteen for sixteen. Less than 16, more than 16. Some people say more. And that's true. All that this parallel, this OMP parallel does is start threads and say each thread executes the same block. So thread zero got all the numbers, and thread one gets the same numbers. They, they both get zeros, zero to 15. So I get 32 bits of output. Or if I had eight ones, I, I'd obviously get more. <clears throat> okay, so not quite what we want. So just doing OMP parallel doesn't parallelize the, the, the code, doesn't do the algorithm for you, right? It just says, here's a piece of code, all go run it. It's single instruction, single data at this point. That's not what we want. Generally, we want to divide up the work. So uh, for that, there's a pragma called OM, pragma OMP4. And so what that does is you put it inside an already existing parallel region. The threads are running. Here comes a loop. I want this, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the indices in this loop or the, the iterations in this loop to be divided up over the process. So pragma OMP4 is a uh, work divider, right? It's, it doesn't spawn the threads. They're already there. It just hands different pieces of that loop over. So if I had eight cores here, it should hand over two values of i to each thread. So if I do two threads, this is, this is what I got. Thread 0 gets 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1 got 8, 9, 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the output again is, is in a random order. Turns out that thread zero was pretty fast initially, right? So, so uh, but the division is equal. So thread zero got everything from zero to seven, and one got everything from eight to uh, 15. If I took more threads, it would be more evenly spread out. So let's show that one. I want to show that. So I can take more threads, and all that happens is they get divided over more threads. They all get a random orders, but they all get it. So of course, there's only really going to be much use if the amount of work in each iteration is more than just writing out a, a simple string. But this is the idea. This is how it, how it shares this. Now, this is, this is the more regular way of doing this, right? I have a loop, a count, I split up that count, that, that range. The, um, yeah, sorry. And not by default, uh, but we'll see in the next lecture how to uh, tweak the breakup of the work so that it load balances. Um, another way to do load balancing is kind of the advanced way is to you might not have a loop. You might have sort of some arbitrary bits of stuff to do, and they're called tasks. And you can create little packets of, of code that's a task and, and give it to essentially a scheduler and say, run it on any core that's free. So that will do load balancing as well. And that, that thing goes with the own task. Um, it's, it's a harder thing to do, and it only works if these tasks are really heavy. If it's just write, writing out a, a line, then all this schedule it has to do to do the load balancing is, is uh, tends to be more expensive than actually just doing it in the loop. Okay. So let's uh, look at something that actually has some work associated with it. Uh, so we, uh, we know from our linear algebra and from our BLAS, uh, calls, a thing called DEXP, <clears throat> double precision, AX plus Y. So we're kind of going to write one. Which we said previously you should never do, and that's absolutely true. But linear algebra routines are very nice loopy algorithms. And so when I want to show how to parallelize a loop, they are sort of the prototypical loop. So I'm going to uh, violate my, my own advice of uh, don't, you, don't write your own linear algebra routines and do it anyway, just to show how a loop parallelization would go. Okay, so with that caveat, um, here's a little uh, code. So there's a function dexp. That I'll write myself. That's why the, it looks it uses RAs and it looks a little bit different. Uh, but basically, it's a 10 million uh, a long uh, vector of doubles. I have three of them. There's a value for a. A times x plus y is going to be stored in z. Um, and I'm going to TikTok it. So I'm going to get the timing uh, because I want to parallelize that and I want to see how much faster it is. Um, and here are the uh, initialization and DEXP routines. So the in initialization just takes two RRAs and fills them. Essentially, x becomes i squared, so element i gets i squared, and y becomes uh, y squared minus 1 in some funny way. Does. Um, that's just filling it with something so I can check the result. And then the DEXP. Um, just does a x plus y for every element in z. Uh, there's these min things because I don't want to go out of bounds, but the example is such that they all have the, all of these arrays have the same size, so it doesn't really matter. Um, this could have said n. Okay, so we see we see what it does, and if I run if I run it, it'll show you what it is when I run it. 
this tells me the time. Uh, this one should have checked the value as well. Um, we're not doing that here. Um, that's bad. Sorry for that. So 0.3 seconds for there. And this is the serial version that I just showed. So now we want to parallelize this. So we have to look at these loops and go, well, I want to parallelize that. So what are the things to consider? Well, first, what can we do in parallel? Right? Not everything can be done in parallel. If you have iterations, if you have time loop, uh, uh, time series where the previous step depends on, or the next step depends on the previous step, then you can't do two steps ahead because you haven't computed step i plus one. So a loop that goes over time that depends on the previous state um, can't be done concurrently. You have to wait until each, uh, each iteration has been done. But if it's a whole bunch of stuff that's, that's done independently, that's, that's where the concurrency lies. Right? And then once we know where the concurrency lies, we have to figure out which variables uh, should be shared and which should be private. Right? So let's look at the answer. So can we see some concurrency here, things that can be done in parallel? I mean, the real question is, is there any dependencies between uh, the actions on each i value, right? So if, both in the initialization, although this is going to be the more heavy uh, part, uh, and here. Is there anything where there's a dependency between each task for each i? All right, I don't see it. So this is a perfect case of, this is why I chose it. So this is pretty easy. We just plunk some parallel OMP parallels in there, default none, and we have to see what's shared, and then share the for loop with pragma OMP for. And we do exactly the same here. <clears throat> so you note that n had to be shared, right? Because each of these has to know exactly what's going on with n. Um, X has to be shared, Y has to be shared. Now, this might seem strange because we want them each to work on a different piece of memory, right? And so you think, well, if they're all shared, don't they write to the same, uh, the same array Z? And that's true, but it doesn't really matter because they're all writing to a different part of the array. So they don't overwrite on it. <clears throat> this int here is inside the whole parallel region, right? So this is a variable that's automatically private. It's declared locally. Each of them has their own input. The pragma omp4 kind of, for each thread, changes this loop to be a different range of i values, such that um, the work is shared. Make sense? That's too now, um, this is extremely common, OK? We, oh, we have uh, a loop. The loop has to be parallelized to so make a parallel region, and then I make an OMP4. So there's a way to combine pragma OMP parallel and pragma OMP4 into pragma OMP parallel 4. They do the same thing, but they do these two things. It spawns the threads, and then it divides the for loop. It's just a little bit annoying to have to start parallel region and then the pragma OMP4 when you just want to basically um, parallelize that one loop. So, and, and there's another convenient thing that um, sort of is an automatic sharing of constants. So this n here doesn't change within the value. So I, I should make it constant. It's actually a better way to do it, right? If the constant doesn't change within the, and it actually shouldn't change. If n changed, throughout this loop, um, this pragma OMP4 didn't know about it. It looks at the value of n at the time when you enter this loop, divides up the work accordingly, and if n somehow gets changed within this, uh, within this uh, body of the loop, that division of work is wrong and all kinds of things. So, and this is sort of a warning, OpenMP will tell you will do what you tell it to do. So if you tell it that this is a parallelizable for loop, which is what you're doing here, you're telling it no dependencies between, uh, between the iterations and no changes of the ranges during these iterations. If you have something that broke out of this loop at some value of n, like using a break statement, uh, that's, that's going to be. So 
it will compile, it will do what it would do if things were correct, which means that the behavior is, is actually undefined. What happens when you compile it that way? The compiler won't raise an error. error. It won't tell you, hey, there's a dependency. It'll just put in the code, but the code won't work. No, no, no. Uh, so, so if they, it, the, the, the dependency is just on a operational level, right? So whether these statements can proceed in any order without changing the result. It's that kind of thing. Whether something is private or not depends on whether uh, each thread should have its own value of something. So for i, it has to have its own value for everything, because otherwise, um, this loop assigns values of i, and all of these threads would be assigning values of i at the same time. And who knows what the actual value would be. That's, a, that's called a race condition. And uh, next time, we're going to look more at, at uh, how to solve these kind of race conditions. But we don't need race conditions here. We just make it a private variable by defining it here. Uh, it depends on the kind of object it is. So if it's an object, so what, what happens is it makes a copy. So whatever happens if, if you were to write uh, x, x copy equals x, that is what's done. So for many objects, like uh, std vectors, or um, that means an actual copy. The whole memory gets copied to a separate array. Um, for our array, what it means, because if you just assign copies, is it just makes a new pointer. And, and, and likewise, for pointers, it just makes a pointer. So I could even make x, y, and even z private here, and it would still work. <clears throat> it's a little bit, it, it is, there's a little overhead because now it has to make an extra copy. Um, so it's not, but it, it would not break this case. But if what I put in were vectors, so vector doubles, it would break. And so it's best to put in what is as close to, to your, your intention, right? If there were pointers, again, it would work, but there would be some overhead. OK, so if we use these, these uh, convenient things, what we can do is we can make int n into a constant. And then I don't have to say that it's shared anymore. In fact, I can, I'm, I'm not allowed by the compiler because it says it's a constant. It's not a variable. You only have to declare the variables, whether they're shared or not, constants you don't. Um, and then I can combine these parallel and for loops there they are, much neater. And then, of course, I clean up the stuff with putting it. So this almost looks like the serial code again. I, I just changed one parallel line, and add one parallel pragma, and one parallel pragma here. And that was all. So when you get a little bit more used to this, it is true that you just take a serial code, go, OK, here are some loops. They're independent. Boom, here's my pragma. Recompile, and it runs faster. <clears throat> But to understand what happens here with all this shared stuff and the parallel and four, if I had just shown you this ahead of time, going, this is how you do it, you, you don't see that there's a lot of stuff going on. The runtime spawns these threads. It shares some of the, uh, the variables. It might make some private copies. It has to make sure that everything is independent. Uh, all of that would, would, would be. And of course, when things work like this, it's fine. But when there's like a, a little bit of dependency that wasn't so clear here, this is clear cut. Um, Gonna get bit. Okay, so let's just see how fast this was as a final, a final thing. So here's my deck speed. It ran in 0.3. Um, I run it with 8. It runs in 0.06 seconds. Hey, five times faster. Let me see if I can. Yeah, that's pretty weird. So if I want to do a scaling test, and this is likely one of the things we'll have as a, as a homework, I can just change the the number of threads and say, okay, for four, oh, I got 0.09. That was nice. For two, oh, I got 0.17. I don't know how good your uh, mental arithmetic is, but um, five times fa faster when using eight threads. Wait, we have eight threads. Why is it it's eight times faster? So obviously, we are hitting some kind of uh, problem here. I've been not paralyzed enough. Oh, it was so trivial. How could we do more? And so um, this is a, a start of, of investigating why 
you don't get perfect scaling. You wouldn't see this if you didn't dare scaling. If you just ran it with eight cores and said, oh, 0.06, oh, that's nice. Um, maybe it's better to always run with six threads um, or to run two things at the same time with four threads. Why not eight threads? So I'll leave you with that question and we'll get back to it yeah, next time. The next time we're going to look at a few more things, race conditions when several threads are, run, are trying to write to the same memory. This performance issue, the one I just hit upon, where I only get five times speed up and I wanted eight. Um, load balancing was already asked. And a, a nice thing called reductions, which, uh, which is when you want to combine otherwise independent actions into, say, a sum. We'll look to the next time. Okay. So today we're going to start actually.